Well, well welcome everyone uh, to Market Talk Season 4. Uh, my name is uh, Gordon Brown. I'm based at the MRC Centre for Medical Mycology, and my co-chair today uh, is Professor Geraldine Butler from the University of College Dublin in Ireland. As always, we have two fantastic speakers lined up for you today. Uh, the first is Professor Jay Byers from Harvard University, who's going to give us a talk around the area of innate immunity. And the second talk is from Professor Carol Monroe from the University of Aberdeen in Scotland, who's going to talk to us about the fungal cell wall. So if you uh, haven't joined this series before, the purpose of this webinar really is to provide the community with an open access platform in which we can all share uh, the wonderful diversity of research that contributes to our field of, of uh, medical mycology. We have two talks uh, uh, on every session. Each talk is around 30 minutes. And at the end, there will be a joint question and answer session. And I just want to point out to you that please submit your questions using the question answer function, not the chat function, as we'll be looking at the question and answer session uh, only. These questions are not shared with the audience uh, and will not show up on the screen, uh, but the chairs at the end will uh, read those questions and assimilate them and then present them to the speakers. And we'll do our very best to get through all the questions in the time frame allowed. Uh, but afterwards, otherwise, uh, your questions will be passed on to the speakers and they will uh, get back to you. As a reminder, we record uh, all our uh, uh, talks on uh, through YouTube and they will be available uh, after the meeting. Uh, and please do encourage uh, students, postdocs and colleagues to, to see these talks if, you, if they have perhaps missed this uh, meeting. Please remember also to register for every market talks um, and you can see the list of upcoming dates. We have one every month and you can register for the market talks uh, through our, our link in the MRC Center uh, that's linked uh, uh, shown uh, below on the slide. Also like to uh, draw your attention to our sisters, two sister series. The first is market clinics. The next one's coming up later in the year. And then the other one is for trainees, uh, which is the medical mycology trainee seminar series. Uh, the next one is in October, and this is a really great opportunity uh, for early career researchers uh, to present their work. So with that introduction, um, let me just stop sharing quickly. It's my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, uh, which is uh, Jay Vias, who's based at the Harvard Medical School. So Jay is a, an immunologist and an infectious disease specialist focusing on host pathogen interactions. He has a long-standing interest uh, on uh, innate immune responses to clinically relevant pathogens. And uh, Jay employs uh, cell biological and biochemical tools to understand the molecular mechanisms that govern immunity to these organisms. His research has advanced uh, our understanding in many areas, and particularly C-type lectins, which is an area that I'm particularly interested in. Uh, and, but today he's going to tell us uh, uh, about the C-gas uh, sting pathway in immunity candida albicans. So Jay, welcome, and we look forward to hearing your presentation. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Gordon. I really appreciate it. I'll just uh, take a moment here to just share my slides. I trust that looks okay to everyone. Well, yep, wonderful. Perfect. Thanks, Jay. Perfect. Thanks, Gordon. So um, as uh, Gordon, thank you uh, to the organizing committee. Thanks to Gordon and Geraldine for the kind invitation uh, to be here. Um, I'd like to share a story that uh, that we've been working on now for a number of years um, that has really tried to link the type 1 interference uh, signaling uh, pathway to host defense uh, for Canada Abacans. Um, and so for this audience, I don't think I have to spend much time um, uh, uh, letting folks know how important uh, fungal infections are. But uh, recently, um, the World Health Organization has prioritized um, uh, fungal organisms and have actually created three separate groups uh, based on uh, the, the health burden of these organisms. Um, we are in our lab, we spend a lot of time thinking about Aspergillus fumigatus as well as Canada albicans, as you can see in the critical group. Um, in the United States, uh, fungal infections have, are, are a cause of $7.2 billion um, of treatment uh, spent annually with greater than 75,000 hospitalizations and 9 million outpatient visits. This is a worldwide burden. Um, and as we know, uh, many of us who are in this field uh, worry on a daily basis about rising rates of antifungal resistance um, and know that many of our patients who are becoming more and more immunologically fragile um, are um, are susceptible to uh, fungal infections, and climate change will continue to have um, an, a, a, an impact on the incidence and the severity of these types of infections. 
And so I'll focus a little bit of my time on uh, Canada um, uh, species uh, for, for those who don't spend as much time thinking about this as a commensal yeast organism that is found in humans, uh, predominantly in the gastrointestinal um, oral skin or vaginal colonization. Uh, unless, unlike most fungi, uh, the Canada species can be transmitted from person to person through either contact or fomites. But when it does cause infection, it is uh, fairly morbid. Um, it is the fourth leading cause of nosocomial bloodstream infections in the United States. And we, as I mentioned about rising rates of infections uh, and antifungal resistance, Canada auris, which is new to the scene of the Canada species causing um, human infections, um, had, we've seen continued rising rates with um, oftentimes difficult to diagnose and difficult to treat um, infections. And so um, many may know that uh, morphology plays an important role um, as a, a virulence factor. I show the, the many types of different um, sizes and, and shapes that fungal organisms can take. Um, we are interested in, we one of the modalities that we use is live cell imaging. So hopefully on the screen to your right, you can see uh, a, um, a movie that we had done where this is macrophages taking up uh, the Canada species in its yeast form. Uh, many of you might be astute to know that you saw uh, hypho formation being formed um, in those in the in that movie early on. And if this might, if you allow this um, uh, experiment to continue on for the 12 to 16 hours that this movie com uh, comprises, you will see that initially the macrophages do very well in terms of controlling fungal infection, but because of the opportunity to, to, to change its shape significantly, you um, at the end of this experiment, all of the macrophages are dead uh, and the Canada have moved um, quickly into its hypho state. Uh, suggesting uh, that th these organisms um, have, we, uh, the immune system has a limited time frame by which it can um, adjust, uh, um, have an impact on that. And when I talk about the immune system, I want to be very clear about the or, uh, the cell types that I will be talking about today, which include predominantly um, monocytes, macrophages, neutrophils, and dendritic cells. Those are the uh, key components of the innate immune response. We'll spend most of our time uh, this afternoon uh, talking about macrophages. Um, and its role in, in this type of infection. Uh, and so this is a paper that is um, uh, a, really a collection, a collective effort from many members of our field back in 2013, uh, from Nature Communications, um, uh, Mihai Netias, Ramnik Xavier, Vinod Kumar, as well as many of their colleagues, um, had identified in a, in a human uh, model of candidiasis or candidemia that um, when they looked at the transcriptional signature uh, that was predominant in that area, they had noticed that interferon signaling was really the dominant process. Um, and when this paper and this uh, was both discussed and, and, and published, it was a, a curiosity in terms of why the, the type 1 interferon or the interferon signaling pathway was so dominant in this process. And, and better understanding this became a, a question in my lab, trying to better understand what was going on and what why interferon signaling and what the role of interferon signaling was in the host defense uh, for canademia. And so I'm going to share with you a story that was largely uh, put together really um, and directed by um, a very talented senior postdoc in my lab by the name of Hannah Brown Harding, um, shown here on left, um, who, had, who came to me from, uh, from Duke and has done just an amazing job in terms of dissecting out the molecular pathways that I will describe. Um, she had an, a wonderful help from two amazing technicians in my lab, uh, Geneva Kwok, who was uh, shown on the top, and Chris Reardon, shown on the bottom. Um, and it is their story that I'm very, very proud to share with you today. So we started by uh, looking at what are the key uh, molecules that are involved in elaborating a type 1 interferon response. And when one does that, um, you focus on the C gas and sting pathway. These are cytosolic, uh, the C gas is a cytosolic DNA sensor that activates the innate immune responses to really elaborate the, uh, the interferon response. And it has been well known in the host pathogen in literature that it, it is, this is activated by viral infections and intracellular bacteria. However, establish uh, an, a, a connection between Canada albicans and the C gas sting pathway had not been previously established. On the cartoon to the right, what I hope you can appreciate is that there's uh, cytosolic DNA engaging the C gas, which then leads to a second molecule, C gamp, which will then activate um, the sting pathway, causing phosphorylation of TDK1, IRF3, and ultimately IRF3 translocates to the nucleus, which allows for the elaboration of these, um, of uh, or activation of these immune stimulated genes. 
And one of the ones that we will use as a faithful reporter of activation of this pathway will be Viprin, which was, is a product of this pathway. And you'll see elaboration of Viprin or soluble interferon as, as part of our readout in our system. So Hannah um, asked uh, three fundamental questions. So number one was, does that Canada Albicans interact with the, this innate immune pathway? Um, and if so, what is the mechanism of activation and what is the functional consequence of activating the CGAS uh, sting pathway? And so in asking that first question, um, we looked towards knockout mice, looking at uh, key molecules that were taken out of this uh, uh, system, specifically sea gas and sting. Uh, and you can see that as we um, uh, used um, an IV Canada canadinia model for in, uh, in, uh, uh, causing infection in these mice, whereas wild type mice would predictably die after a dose of Canada, uh, uh, IV Canada albicans, you can see that there was um, resistance in the sea gas knockout as well as the, in the sting knockout mice, um, which uh, to us was very exciting, clearly establishing a role for these two molecules and this pathway in the host defense of canademia, but its ability to actually be, have that protein knocked out or disable that pathway and lead to survival was a paradoxical effect that we wanted to understand at, the, at, a, at a molecular and mechanistic level. So, uh, so, so Hannah set out to understand what the mechanism of activation was. Um, so, what could be driving uh, the uh, or what could be what could be delivering this Canada DNA? Recognizing the CGAS sting pathway, the central ligand in that pathway is DNA. We spent a lot of time thinking um, how, uh, from a topological point of view, how Canada DNA, which is typically sequestered in the nucleus. Um, and thinking about phagocytosis, phagosome uh, formation, and phagosome maturation, which is a, a large part of what my lab has been focused on, how topologically could that uh, could the, the DNA from the nucleus actually be entering into the cytosol? And I will not share with you uh, uh, loads of data where we were unable to make that um, that firm connection. Rather, we started to think about where other where other sources of Canada DNA might exist, and that led us to thinking about Canada albicans derived extracellular vesicles. Um, these extracellular vesicles are secreted by Canada. It's a form of their um, ability to communicate amongst those organisms. It's pr present in biofilm. We know that there the amount uh, of elaboration of these extracellular vesicles are are increased in the setting of of stress and infection. And there was some data already in the literature that suggested that um, these extracellular vesicles can be um, uh, taken up by macrophages and engaged in the cytosol. So this is some data from Vargas et al. in 2015 that demonstrated um, the ability to, to be able to see extracellular vesicles in the cytoplasm of uh, ma macrophages. Uh, and most importantly, these extracellular vesicles contain loads of uh, nucle nucleic acid, both uh, DNA and RNA. And so Hannah set out to ask the question, whether uh, Canada EVs or extracellular vesicles could trigger this sting pathway. <clears throat> and so she set up uh, experiments where we took um, um, uh, uh, macrophages, either from uh, that they're drive, they're, they're all immortalized, but we've done this in primary cells and this, the same phenotype is held true, where they're either are wild types, so they have the entire component of that type one pathway, CGAS sting pathway that we talked about one that lacks sea gas or one that lacks sting. And then we added in um, uh, those EVs to see if we could uh, demonstrate um, the, uh, the activation of this pathway. We used as our readout, as I mentioned, elaboration of uh, uh, Viperin um, and seeing if that was induced or um, looked at soluble factors such as interferon beta um, in, the, in the cytoplasm. We used CGAMP and, uh, as a positive control, and we used ergesterol, which is the main constituent of these um, of the lipids seen in the extracellular vesicles um, as a negative control. And the, so you, as you can see on the slide, these cells were stimulated uh, for six hours. And so the data um, hopefully are fairly clear to you. You can see on the, uh, in, the in the Western blot that when we used wild type uh, uh, cells, um, either with uh, CGAMP as the positive control, or use uh, extracellular vesicles independent of how they were uh, derived, whether they came from the biofilm derived or whether they were derived from plectectonic organisms that were grown, you could see robust amounts of vibrin being produced. And on the right, you can see that that also uh, phenocopied in terms of the amount of interferon that was being uh, created. But when we looked at um, cells that lacked either sea gas or sting, 
those signals were completely abrogated, suggesting that uh, EVs were both recognized, uh, being internalized, engaged in the cytoplasm, and activating this pathway in a sea gas and sting um, independent manner. Uh, we then looked to see if we could establish this at a cell biological level, um, and uh, this allowed us to uh, take advantage of a, a molecule that John Kagan um, here at Boston Children's Hospital uh, had uh, uh, put together where we could then append sea gas to a GFP uh, reporter molecule, uh, and then we could uh, see where sea gas um, ended up. Um, earlier data had suggested that sea gas, even though it is a cytoplasmic uh, DNA sensor, um, constitutively uh, lives on the nuclear envelope. Um, and then when it does come into contact with this cytoplasmic DNA, um, undergoes a, a significant translocation to the cytoplasmic area. So these are macrophages that um, do, or don't have any EVs and we can follow the GFP signal, or we also labeled the, uh, the EVs uh, with the red labels you can see in these false colored images. Um, and you can see that when we do add in EVs, that nuclear membrane um, associated um, uh, sea gas quickly translocates to a cytoplasmic um, signal so that um, we see nice translocation in the presence of EVs. And in this image that Hannah was able to um, isolate, you can see that there are two cells, one that has taken up a significant amount of EVs where you see this significant translocation and just below it, a cell where the, the, the EV is still aware that where despite the fact that it didn't take up a lot of, uh, it didn't take up a lot of EVs and therefore as a result, the, the sea gas is still in the, in the nuclear range. So we are we do recognize that uh, that EVs are being uh, recognized by um, uh, uh, by um, by sea gas and and uh, allowing for this transfer translocation to occur. And she's quantitated these images that you as you can see uh, towards the right. Um, and so we recognize that the these uh, extracellular vesicles, while uh, it, it would be they are they do have a significant amount of um, of DNA in them. We also recognize that this that they all have also have a host of other uh, molecules associated with it, and I'm just listing a few of those molecules there, in including um, membrane proteins um, as well as RNA um, associated with that um, in in that setting. And so, what we wanted to do was try to look to see whether in those, if we were able to pull out the DNA from the biofilms, would we then be able to also uh, recapitulate uh, that process um, in, in that setting. And so um, Geneva uh, took the lead um, last summer in terms of working on much of this, um, isolating uh, the DNA from our biofilms um, in, a, in, a, in, in, the, in a protocol that you can see cartooned on the left side. And then we added this um, in a way to try to see if we could stimulate uh, viper production. Again, a readout of this C-guesting pathway um, and what I hope you can appreciate is that in in that setting, if we use it, uh, use the um, um, uh, a trans, we we have to then take since it's simply naked DNA. If we envelop that into a transfection reagent and allow it uh, efficient delivery to the cytosol, you can see here um, that there is significant amount of viperin that's being produced. If we do not use our transfection reagent. Um, that is uh, that shows that viperin isn't being produced, so there has to be some uh, entry into the cytoplasm. And if we treat the DNA with a benzenase um, in this area, so the, which is a specific DNA, we can abrogate the signal, suggesting that the signal is derived entirely from um, uh, from the DNA ligand that, that we're isolating out of the biofilm and not some other carrier molecule. And that phenocopy is very well with uh, what we saw with uh, with interferon beta. Um, as well in, 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 that, in that setting. So Canada biofilm DNA trigger sting a pathway activation, and this is really dependent on both transfection and the DNA that's there. And then finally, while I have mentioned it a couple of times, um, Hannah went on to formally uh, uh, demonstrate that, um, that uh, the use of a molecule to block endocytosis, a clathrin-dependent um, uh, process, using a small molecule called dinosaur, we can actually efficiently block the ability of uh, Canada EVs to actually trigger this production. So we do know that it isn't simply the uh, association of those EVs, but actually active transport of those EVs taken up by in the macrophages and delivered to the cytosol, which is required for um, C gas activation and ultimately activation of this particular type of pathway. So she then wanted to understand what the functional consequences were of activating this uh, sting pathway. Um, and so uh, we went back to those mice that we were looking at, recognizing that our uh, wild-type mice were dying 
um, at a at a at a uh, at a predictable rate, um, and based on many other work, of, um, I'm sure many audience members have done in their own uh, research programs, and then looking at what we saw in the in the sting pathway. And because those sting mice live longer, we can also interrogate those mice to see what their fungal burden is, um, specifically in the kidney. Um, and as we, and to our surprise, we actually noticed that um, despite the fact that they had a survival advantage over the wild type mice, uh, these mice did carry detectable amounts of fungal burden for many days um, out uh, beyond uh, uh, in, in the course of that. And we've now gone out to close to 90 days and have seen detectable fungal burden in these mice. So despite that they have a survival ad advantage, they're, they're, they, they're incapable of fully clearing the organism um, in, in, in that way. And what we were also able to demonstrate, um, uh, again, it was to, uh, was to see whether their ability to kill these organisms was muted as compared to wild type when you looked in an in vitro assay for killing of these particular types of, um, of, of fungal organisms. And so as a result of these, um, it, it was telling us that there is a survival advantage, but the cost of that survival advantage um, was, was increased fungal burden. And one of the mechanisms was a decreased um, ability to kill. Interestingly, when we did look at the histopathology as we did in collaboration with Lauren Ritchie um, over at, at Tufts, we did notice that there were a number of um, abscesses that would form in the kidneys of the wild type mice um, uh, in, in that area. And yet the, uh, when we looked at the sting uh, knockout mice, we saw uh, very few, we saw essentially no collections of abscesses formed um, in the early or in, the, in, 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 in some of the later phases of the, um, uh, of the infection. Um, so despite the fact that it had a higher fungal burden, we did not see the kind of same organization in the tissue level uh, of what we would have typically expect to see in the wild type as it, re as it related to um, uh, trying to contain uh, this type of infection. Uh, and we know that that's going to likely require a little bit more uh, work to try to uh, fully sort out what is going on, uh, perhaps using spatial transcriptomics to better understand what um, so additional signals are required using the sea gas and sting pathway. Um, we've also recognized that we needed to better understand how this was impacting the broader transcript transcriptome within those innate immune cells. Um, and so we then uh, looked to a, um, a nanostring based experiment where we were able to um, uh, specifically uh, interrogate uh, close to 770 um, host response genes that were pre-selected really for um, enriching for those immune stimulated uh, genes. And so what Hannah did was to take uh, wild type macrophages or sea gas or sting knockout macrophages, um, uh, expose them to extracellular vesicles or um, lipofectamine or with the biofilm uh, DNA as, as um, uh, to, to, to look at this. And then we extracted the RNA from those um, macrophages and then uh, interrogated the, the transcriptional response. And so what we could see um, in, in that setting was in uh, that uh, uh, predictably a number of those uh, er, er, uh, interferon stimulating genes were turned on. Um, many of those that you can see that are in bold are some of the ones that were uh, particularly turned on um, in that way. And they were turned on in a very specific sea gas and sting uh, dependent manner, such as, so suggesting that, as, uh, that these uh, molecules were absolutely required um, the this type one interferon pathway or the sea gasting pathway to be turned on so that uh, they would we would uh, that the, these genes would be turned on the consequence of turning on all of these genes and its host response has not been fully elaborated but it now allows us to continue to explore um, uh, what the role is of for instance r 2 or c 8 cell 10 um, uh, in, in 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 the host response um, uh, if, to these uh, organisms. We also do know that there are some data to suggest, uh, for instance, in if it three other groups have already identified that as a key molecule um, in the host defense of, of Canada, and we think that this might be part of the mechanism by which we uh, see uh, we see that. So, um, uh, with the final piece of data that I wanted to just share with you uh, uh, is how does this? Uh, we've done this in the mouse, but how does this actually um, look in humans? Um, so to, for that, we turn to um, a, a collaborator um, and colleague, uh, Frank Bandavadonk, um, and Vinod Kumar, um, along with a talented um, 
um, uh, 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 trainee in their lab, uh, Collins Bohan, um, who looked uh, in their 500 FG cohort to see whether there were altered cytokine levels in human monocytes um, at these uh, C gas and uh, sting loci. And what we were, uh, uh, to our uh, to our satisfaction, we were able to see that um, there were single nucleotide polymorphisms in C gas. And in the next slide, which I will share with you, um, the, uh, uh, in in sting, that actually uh, uh, were directly associated with uh, uh, elaboration of TNF and IL six um, in this in the C gas pathway, um, as well as um, you can see that um, as in the uh, in the sting pathway as well. Um, which suggested to us that uh, polymorphisms in this particular area will directly impact the amount of cytokine uh, that is that is that is delivered and likely will have a, a result in terms of the outcome of that type of infection um, in in humans. Um, and so to, for us, that was very exciting uh, ability to be able to validate many of our mouse findings um, in a in a human model for um, for IV candidemia. Um, so let me uh, share with you um, uh, some of the kind of the answers that Hannah asked with these three questions. Um, she asked, does uh, Canada albicans interact with this innate immune pathway? Um, and I think I hope that I convinced you that the answer is yes. Um, we wanted to better understand what the mechanism was for activation. And um, we understood that Canada albicans DNA packaged in extracellular vesicles triggers uh, C-gas translocation and uh, sting pathway activation. And we think that the functional consequence of activating the sting pathway is for significant um, interference uh, stimulated gene induction, um, elaboration of inflammation, which at times can be pathologic, um, and um, also directly uh, affects fungal clearance um, in, in this mouse model of infection. Um, so with that, I'm going to end my talk by uh, really highlighting again some of the most important uh, individuals that did this work. Uh, which I mentioned, um, Hannah, as well as Geneva and Chris. Um, other people who contributed in the lab include uh, Jen and Becca, um, Ari, um, Kyle, uh, Tammy, and a longtime collaborator and, and um, neighbor on our floor, uh, Michael Mansour. We could not have done this without some wonderful collaborations, uh, both here in the United States and, and around the world, um, including uh, Josh Noshinchuk from Albert Einstein, um, Dave Andes from University of Wisconsin, John Kagan from Boston Children's Hospital, um, uh, Frank van der Belak and Vinod from the Rybaud uh, and Robi Bhattacharya from the Broad Institute. And I will also acknowledge um, uh, the NIH as a, as a funding mechanism as well. So appreciate your uh, time. I'm happy to stick around towards the end uh, to, uh, to answer any questions. Thank you. So thanks very much, Jay. Um, your particularly beautiful slides, I have to say. So just to uh, remind our audience that we'll have questions after the second talk, and please remember to put them in the Q&A, and please put the name or the initials of the speaker first so that we know who to direct the questions to. So our second speaker today is Carol Munro. And Carol is a graduate of the University of Aberdeen, where she currently holds a personal chair in microbiology. So lots of us have interacted with Carol in her many professional roles, including as Deputy Editor-in-Chief of FEMS Yeast Research and also Chair of the FEMS Advanced Course in Human Fungal Pathogens. The Monroe Group is very well known for research in cell wall biosynthesis, particularly in Candida albicans, but she's worked in many other Candida species and several other fungi, and yeah, recently even on, even on SARS-CoV-2. So we're delighted to welcome Carol here today and to hear her talk on targeting the fungal cell wall. So over to you, Carol. Great, thanks, Geraldine. <clears throat> I'll just uh, share my uh, screen. Can you see that now? Uh, that No, we're seeing your email, I think. Ah, okay. Let me see. There we go. What yes, about now? that is, that yeah. is. Great, thank you very much. So yes, thanks to Gordon and Geraldine and the organising committee for um, the invitation to tell you about our work. I'm going to talk to you mainly about the fungal cell wall of Candida albicans, but also touch on a few other species as I go along. The talk will be uh, split into two halves. The first half, I will describe how the fungi uh, change their cell wall, modify their cell wall, in response to antifungal stress. And then the second part, I will describe how we've used this knowledge to direct um, our uh, 
the research towards developing antibodies against uh, fungal cell surface proteins as potentially a new therapeutic. And this um, antibody project is a collaboration with the Scottish Biologics Facility here at the University of Aberdeen. There we go. I just wanted to start with my acknowledgements and um, thank all the members of my group that have contributed to the research over the years and particularly those that are highlighted with the black black outlines and um, that this work I'm talking about today. And as I go through the, the talk, I will be um, mentioning the people that have contributed to that research. At the Scottish Biologics Facility, we have Dr. Sumia Palil and Professor Andy Porter, who are providing the antibody expertise and the animal work that I'm going to talk about today was performed in Aberdeen by Donna McCallum. Over the years, a number of undergraduates and master's students have also contributed to the project. And I'd also like to um, acknowledge the funders, especially uh, Salsa University of Aberdeen and um, East Bio and um, more recently Scottish Enterprise. So I'm going to dive straight into uh, Candida albicans. We know it's a very successful uh, pathogen, and it's because it has a network of virulence factors and attributes that contributes to this success as a pathogen. And um, I'm going to talk today about the cell wall, and you can see that the cell wall is interlinked to a number of these different virulence attributes, whether it's contributing towards immune evasion, biofilm formation, adhesion, um, and the ability of the, of the cells to switch morphology. So the cell wall has, has many functions. Um, it provides the uh, cells with um, protection against, I'm just gonna pop my pointer on here, um, against physical damage. Um, the components of the cell wall are important for recognition by the host immune cells. Also the cell wall proteins and enzymes contribute to making the extracellular matrix of the biofilm. And there are a number of virulence factors that are embedded in the cell wall, for example, the ALS3 family of adhesins. And as a polymorphic fungus like Candida albicin switches from yeast to, to hyphae, it has to reorientate its new growth and lay down its cell wall in a different way, switching from isotropic growth in yeast cells to polarized growth in hyphae. And this is all down to it redirecting the generation of the new cell wall. And today I'm also going to touch on why I think the cell wall of of fungal cells is really important for antifungal drug susceptibility, and obviously that can have an impact in the clinic. And this is a scalar model of um, the cell wall that was published by Megan Lenardin and Neil Gao um, a few years ago. And next to it, I have a lecture micrograph um, showing you the different layers of the fungal cell wall. And we have this outer layer that's rich in fibrils of N manan. The N manan uh, highly glycosylated um, manon chains are attached to the cell wall proteins and the major class are these GPI anchored cell wall proteins. The cell wall proteins uh, in turn are cross-linked um, to beta 16 glucan which binds the proteins to the skeletal parts of the cell wall, the beta 13 glucan and the chitin. And this is in the inner layer that gives the uh, cell wall its tensile strength. So these cell wall polysaccharides are fungal specific and that's why they are good targets for antifungals. And that's been realized by the uh, use of the canicandins in the clinic that uh, inhibit the synthesis of beta 13 glucan. And in, in my talk today, um, I'm gonna to tell you about how we're uh, targeting monoproteins in the cell wall with potential new anti, uh, antibody therapy. We already know that the cell envelope is, is an important target for antifungals, so the azoles and the polyenes target ergosterol in the membrane, and the echinocandins target the FKS1, the catalytic subunit of glucan synthase. We also have some new drugs that are under development at the moment that block GPI anchor biosynthesis pathway and a new glucan synthase inhibitor, inhibitor Ibrexafungar. So I've been for many years interested in the fungal cell wall glycoproteome. So these are the, the cell wall proteins that are attached to the cell wall and the major class are conveniently attached via modified glycosyl phosphatidyl and oxidyl anchor. 
And these proteins um, include 22 gene families, so there's functional redundancy here. But staggeringly, we don't know the function of around 70% of these uh, proteins. Those that we do know the function, they have important roles in pathogenicity, um, including the adhesins, uh, ALS3 in basin, which also binds iron. Proteins are important for biofilm formation, another important virulence factor. Superoxide dismutases that can uh, fight oxidative stress, stress that um, the host uses to fight off the pathogen. And I'm going to um, highlight these carbohydrate active enzymes. They are localized, covalently attached to the cell wall. And they're important for remodeling and building a strong well, a strong wall. They're often also called remodelases. So as a polymorphic fungus like Candida albicans switches between its different morphologies, it, it changes its cell surface. So we know there are yeast specific proteins like YWP1 um, and there are hypho specific or hypho associated proteins they are important for pathogenicity, HWP1, ALS3, and HYR1. We also know that hyphae have more chitin than the yeast. So as, as the fungus switches these morphologies, it's also switching its outer surface coat. But the acanacandins are um, a successful drug to use in the clinic. Um, they're very good at killing candida, candida cells, candida albicans cells. And they, as I say, inhibit the FKS1's catalytic subunit of the glucan synthase. And work from David Pearl and others have shown that a specific hotspot mutations in the FKS1 protein can then confer resistance to these acanacandins. Um, it tends to happen only rarely with candida albicans, but we do get resistance emerging in the clinic. And we've shown over the years, as when I uh, worked with Neil Gao in the past, that when you treat cells with casperfungin, the cells will respond by thickening their cell wall. This is suboptimal sub-MIC concentrations of casperfungin. And this uh, is true for candida albicans and other candida species, as well as Aspergillus fumigatus. And we showed by using time-lapse mic microfluidics, as you treat these cells with uh, casperfungin for um, prolonged periods, the cells upregulate their chitin production. And we also showed that cells that have high chitin are less susceptible to drug than cells that have a uh, normal chitin, uh, well type chitin level shown in blue here. So high chitin cells are less susceptible to drug. And we also have this phenomenon, which we see in vitro, where at really high concentrations of uh, casperfungin cells can retain their viability. And we think this is due to the uh, activation of salvage pathways and then the remodeling of the cell wall at these very high concentrations of drug. I'm going to show you some movies now. Um, just, just switch my uh, pointer off for a minute. Um, and uh, what these movies will show you is um, the, on the left-hand side of your screen, wild-type candida albicans with normal chitin levels. When you treat it with casperfungin, you can see that some of the cells start to upregulate the chitin, but generally casperfungin will um, inhibit those cell growth. On the right-hand panel, what we've got here are uh, high chitin cells. Um, if we just wait for this to, to loop around again, the high chitin cells um, are induced by giving your cells calcium clothra white. And those cells, when you then wash out that calcium clothra white and uh, flush in some casperfungin, you can see those cells totally ignore the drug and, and carry on growing. And you'll see some really bright cells within that population that have upregulated their, their chitin levels. So these high chitin cells are not responding to casperfungin drug um, anymore. We're also interested in looking at how uh, the differences in the cell wall might impinge on the drug susceptibility of different candida species. So we used electron microscopy to uh, look at the cell wall architecture of these different uh, species and looked at the length in particular of this outer fibular layer. And when we, and these are the reference strains for each of these species. When we compared this with um, the IC50 for casperfungin, there really wasn't an association between the, uh, the different layers of the cell wall and their ability to withstand the drug. But this is only one reference strain for each species. And of course, we know now that the interspecies variation, especially in terms of cell wall, is really important um, and, and cells can become resistant 
uh, because of the cell wall remodeling. Um, and here's examples um, of when we treat the cells with uh, Caspar fungin, that we can see that for uh, Candor albicans shown on the top panels, with Caspar fungin, we get uh, more beta glucan exposure, you get more chitin exposure, and also the manan um, becomes more prominent in the cell walls, we get increased manan. And we're also seeing the same with Candida gobrata. When we treat with Caspar fungin, we get higher uh, glucan exposure, subtle change in the chitin levels, but we do see more manan in those Caspar fungin treated cells. We wanted to investigate this um, in more detail, looking at the mechanism. And I'm going to explain to you now um, PhD project of Giuseppe Bura de Cesari, um, which was funded by the Opathy EU network. And Giuseppe looked at a number of different clinical isolates that were drug sensitive and resistant and used all our different techniques to try and analyze the cell wall of these different isolates with the aim of trying to identify a, a biomarker for antifungal resistance. So you had a panel of isolates, six that were sensitive to chirocandins and three that were resistant to chirocandins. And for two of these, at least we knew that they had hotspot mutations in FKS1 that confer that resistance. So first of all, um, Giuseppe used flow cytometry to look at what changes are there at the cell surface when you treated those different isolates with Caspar fungin. And could we see differences between the drug sensitive and the drug resistant isolates? And you won't be able to read these labels very well, but they, um, the take home message is that really all of these isolates didn't matter whether they were resistant or sensitive to the drug, all upregulated their, their chitin levels and exposed more beta 1, 3 glucan and increased their manan levels in response to uh, the drug treatment. We then went on to do cell surface proteomics to look at what difference there were in the cell wall proteins in the resistant versus the susceptible isolates. And you could see that there were a number of proteins that were more abundant in the cell walls of the resistant isolates. Um, and these include things like PHR2, PG10, and SUN41. And these are translycosidases that are important for remodeling um, and modifying the beta 1, 3 glucan in the wall. And these proteins are also known to be involved in biofilm formation and iron binding. But also when we looked at, um, when we exposed those isolates to Caspar fungin again, we could see um, changes in the cell wall proteome. Um, PHR2 and PG31 in particular were more abundant in the drug resistant isolates. But when we treated them with Caspar fungin, we could see things like SUN41 and HYR1 becoming more abundant in response to that drug treatment. So we're building a model where we can say that Caspar fungin, if it doesn't kill the cell straight away, will activate cell wall salvage pathways, which results in increased chitin and changes in the cell wall proteome. And this can affect susceptibility to canicandins, to other stresses, and, and alter their interactions with the host cells, which I don't have time to talk about today. So you wanted to use that knowledge to then to start to identify targets in the cell wall, targets that we knew were important for cell wall remodeling. And so we used the combination of this proteome profiling that we did um, and highlighting some of the proteins that we're um, interested in. And um, these are the results of quantitative proteomics where we could see 14 fold higher PG31 when we treated with drug and 10 fold higher PH PHR2 and five fold higher UTR2 in response to drug. We also wanted to identify um, if these changes were happening in vivo. So we came to the systemic mouse model of candidiasis. We took kidneys, uh, infected kidneys from the mice and extracted RNA and did transcript profiling, looking at our, our favorite genes. And the mice were either treated with saline or with Caspar fungin. In those Caspar fungin treated uh, mice, we could see that there is higher expression of UTR2 shown here in green and PGA31. So gene expression is also going up in vivo in a mouse model when the mice are treated with Caspar fungin. So we wanted to select a number of candidates to uh, develop surface targeting antibodies against. And there was a number of criteria that I wanted to, uh, to tick the boxes for um, in, in that selection process. So first of all, we wanted targets that were expressed in vivo in a mouse model. Um, we wanted targets where we knew that there were antibodies against these proteins in patient, patient sera, what sera with invasive fungal infections, that they had altered expression um, in response to antifungals or, drug, or in drug-resistant isolates, um, that they were either um, pan-candida 
or species specific, um, and that we could see lower no variation in these uh, protein sequences when we looked at all the genomes that have been sequenced with candida albicans, and also that these would be required for virulence. And from all this selection, um, I chose those three proteins that I've already been highlighting in the talk, PHR2, UTR2, and PJ31. And guided by our proteomics, we um, selected three target peptides that we know were surface exposed in those proteins on the candida albicans cell wall. So this is where we turn to the expertise of the Scottish Biologics Facility um, to identify and isolate antibodies against these um, targets. So I just want to show you, first of all, the example of the UTR2 target peptide, which lies in this sort of external um, loop of the protein here. And if you look at the, the homology models of the um, UTR2 protein, the peptide that we selected actually lies in the substrate binding groove of the, of the enzyme. So what we did was we took peptides um, against these targets and we panned um, phage display libraries. These are human naive phage display libraries to find phage binders that could add, um, bind to the targets. And then we can reformat those phage um, antibodies into uh, single chain antibody fragments and full monoclonal IgG molecules that we could then test and characterize in the lab and finally do some animal studies. So we immobilize the candida peptides and then we do several rounds of panning with the phage display library to select the really strong phage binders. Um, we take those phage binders and then we format them into single chain antibody fragments that we can test in the lab for binding properties. And then the lead candidates were uh, fully um, reformatted as uh, IgG molecules and we used a, a murine framework for this. So we could test them in our mouse, mouse models. So here's some examples of the ranking that we did. So this is uh, our PG31 um, single chain antibody fragments um, that we can show binding. And these are ELISA um, results binding to our PG31 peptide. We could show binding to a uh, whole candida albicans hyphae. And also in cell lysates, where we treated the cells with caspofungin, we could see stronger binding of the antibodies to those um, caspofungin treated cells and also no binding in our non-mutant to show the specificity of the, um, of the antibodies. So from, um, we'd got quite a large number of different uh, antibody sequences that bound to these proteins. So these were all unique sequences when we um, sequenced our binding domains, but we ranked them and characterized them and came up with two lead candidates, which we then uh, converted into these fully um, mouse IgG molecules, but they contain the human binding domains here. And in that conversion from the single chain antibodies to the monoclonal antibodies, you could see a thousand fold increase in the binding affinities of these antibodies. We've now gone on and uh, looked at the binding of these antibodies um, to Candida glabrata um, as well as Candida auris. And um, we can see some. Um, cross-reactivity, some binding to candida glabrata, especially when we treat it with caspofungin, and this is a sensitive wild-type reference strain. Um, in drug-resistant um, candida glabrata, we can see binding even in the absence of drug treatment. Um, with our candida auris, we could see binding um, to these uh, caspofungin-resistant isolates, again, without um, prior exposure to caspofungin. And here's a fluconazole-resistant candida auris isolate where again, we could see um, enhanced binding when we treated that with caspofungin. So our antibodies are cross-reactive to other important um, and also more important drug-resistant uh, pathogens. When we look at the uh, where the antibodies bind on cells by immunofluorescent microscopy, um, we can see that for the yeast cells treated with caspofungin, and this is our anti-UTR2 um, antibody, we can see binding here in, in punctate of spots along the cell wall. Um, and the binding is, is really uh, strong against um, hyphal cells. And again, even without caspofungin treatment, UTR2, bi UTR2 antibodies bind along the hyphae, and we can especially see binding at the hyphal tip there, and no binding with our isotype control antibody. So with all that information in hand, we decided to uh, turn to our, our mouse model and this is where we got uh, help from Donna McCallum. And we did, we've done these mice experiments in two different times now. 
we have a prophylactic arm when we come in with the antibodies three hours prior to um, infecting the mice with the candida albicans, or we have a uh, treatment arm, so we treat with the antibodies 24 hours after the infection has started or 72 hours. And um, we have caspofungin as a positive control arm and saline as a negative control. And we were delighted to see that with our PGA31 MAB treated mice, there was 88% survival. With our UTR2 treated MAB mice, 33% survival. And our isopeg control, the, the mouse succumbed to the infection. Um, and these survival numbers uh, refl are reflected in the um, kidney burdens, where we can see with our saline control, we have uh, negative control, we have high fungal burdens in the kidneys, which are reduced with the caspofungin treatment. We also see a significant two to three log fold reduction in the mice that are treated with the PG31 map, especially in the prophylactic arm here, shown here. So we get reduced burdens and better survival of the mice. This is also reflected in the kidney sections where you can see um, microabscesses, the filaments of the fungi growing um, in the IgG isotype control treated mice. The filaments and the fungal elements are cleared in caspofungin treated mice. And you can see a vast reduction in um, our monoclonal treated mice. So now we have um, reformatted the MABs into fully human MABs, which we are now testing in the lab. And again, we can see very nice binding with our fully human MABs to, again, to hyphae without caspofungin treatment. This is the anti-UTR2 MAB and the anti-PG31 MAB. And then when we treat with caspofungin, again, we see this nice binding on the hyphae um, with the anti-UTR2 MAB. And what is interesting and fascinating is that for the anti-PG31 MAB, we only now see binding at that very tip of the hyphae. So we see a relocalization of the protein um, in response to caspofungin treatment. So these maps are also telling us a little bit more about how the cell wall is, uh, cell wall proteins are localized in these cells. So in conclusion, I just wanted to say that um, we've shown that the cell wall is remodeled in response to caspofungin and that can reduce susceptibility of strains. We developed an antifungal antibody pipeline and with proteomics guiding our selection of uh, surface exposed epitopes to isolate antibodies against those targets. Um, and we've shown that they're efficient or effective in a, a mouse model of systemic disease. And now we are now proposing these uh, antibodies as a promising new class of biologics-based therapeutics um, against anti uh, fungal pathogens. And we've got Scottish Enterprise money now to um, spin out a company, Bridget Biologics, in the next year. And um, look forward to sharing the updates with you on, on that uh, discovery platform. And with that, I will finish my talk and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Carol. That's very wonderful and very exciting to see something therapeutic start to come out of the research. It's really wonderful. Okay, so just to remind everyone, please pop your questions into the question and answer function and Geraldine and I will now tag team between Jay and Carol with our questions. And I'll kick off, Jay, and I'm gonna use the chair's prerogative to ask my question first which is in your lovely model where you show that these extracellular vesicles get inside cells. There's a step missing, which is how does the DNA actually get into the cytoplasm? Because it's already membrane bound in the vesicle. And if it's even if it's endocytosis, it'll still be membrane bound. And in, in organisms like TB, they generally secrete pores in the membrane, make pores in the membrane. So I'm wondering whether you've explored how the DNA gets out of the membranes into the cytoplasm. And um, so the short answer is, uh, Gordon, great question. We don't know the, the full answer to that. We don't know whether the uh, the the event that's occurring at the cytoplasm, uh, the, the membrane is actually um, a fusion and then it's, it's a, a deposition of that material into the cytoplasm in a free way that would make it easily accessible. Or is it um, that there is a discrete one and then the many proteins that are associated with that or recruitment of other mammalian proteins might be um, in charge of responsible for pulling that out? Um, you know, we have thought about canadolysin as one of those molecules that might be a way by which that can happen. We have not explored that, that question, but I do, do think it's a relevant one. And does this work also in uh, epithelial cells? That was a question asked by Sarah Gaffney. Yeah, so we know that epithelial cells are a source of significant amount of type 1 interferon. Um, and so I would assume that the mechanism, the machinery is there. 
whether this part is operant in that area is a question that we have not explored. I think it's a great question um, that, and, and we do need to look at that. We focus mostly on the macrophages simply because we had the tools by which we could do it. I suspect uh, without any data that it is gonna be operant in a lot of other cells, but we don't know the answer to that yet. Okay, thanks, Jay. Over to you, Geraldine. Hey, um, for question from Neil Gox. Gox, have you tried using antibodies to both PGA31 and UTR2 together as a polyvalent therapeutic to look for synergistic effects? That's a very good question. It's on our to-do list. We have a number of different animal uh, studies they want to do next. We can use combinations of the antibodies together, or we have thought about using, trying to, well, design the bivalent antibodies, yes, so definitely. And the idea would be that because they're both in the cell wall, we're, we're now looking at localization of the two protein targets to see whether that would actually work. But yeah, that's a, that's a great idea. Okay, Gordon, you? Right, a couple of questions about type one interference, Jay. So the question is, what's the role of type one interference in this process at all? And if you had to add back type one interference, to the cells that alter, to the cells that lack C gas and sting, does that affect outcome? Um, I think, again, great questions. Um, I think the role of type 1 interferon, I, my suspicion is that it is um, allowing the cells or the elaboration of the type 1 interferons to um, enhance its cytal ability towards the organism. We saw that when we disable that within the macrophages, those um, macrophages are are less efficient in terms of killing the organism. So I suspect that's the case. The other corollary that we see is that if we look at these sea gas and sting knockout mice, um, they're, they continue to have a fungal burden, which suggests to us that there's a defect in the ability to clear the organism and kill the organism efficiently. Um, to, in terms of adding that back, we have not done that experiment where we add back to those mice. It's um, always a little bit more challenging to try to figure out like when and where that would happen. Um, uh, and and how to how to do that? We have um, um, recognizing that there we, we've done this in this in the in the genetic knockout. The the there are now sting inhibitors, small molecule sting inhibitors that are now being used in the clinic for 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 uh, purposes of cancer, um, and we've taken those and done some uh, initial in vitro experiments and shown that that has phenocopied the sting knockout mice. And so we could use that small molecule again um, at different time points in the in vivo experiment to get a better sense as to where, uh, at what point is it critical that uh, that the sting um, C gas pathway is is operational. Okay, and then just following up on the killing aspect, sorry, Geraldine, just before we hand over. So get, following up on the killing aspect, do you know what the defect is in the killing? It was the question that came through. Uh, we don't know precisely why they're less efficient in killing. Um, and so we we are working on trying to understand whether this has directly to do with ROS production or whether it has to do with, let's say, with phagosome, phagolysosome acidification or any of the other effector mechanisms that are seen in this. Um, and specifically, a lot of our work that has been done in macrophages, and we know that neutrophils play also a very important role here, and that's largely been unexplored. So we we have some tools by which we can start to answer those questions, but we don't know these, those, those answers yet. I think they're really important to better understand and dissect this, this pathway. Okay, thank you. Geraldine. Hey, Carol, do you have any idea what the function of PGA31 is? <laughs> Just, <laughs> Sorry, I'm you, laughing. I, I wish. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Before you answer it, um, you 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 said that the antibodies bound to glabrata and albicans. So, do you get are the homologs PGA thirty one and the other ones in those two? Um. Yeah, I think the there's definitely a Candida auris PGA thirty one homolog. Um. I think glabrata, possibly not. Um. So the PGA thirty one is a really interesting so it's definitely um so it's not expressed when you grow candida albicans in the lab under ypd conditions but you put the al albicans into mice or any in vivo situation it's expressed the same way if you put a, a cell wall stress whether it's casper fungin or casper white you get up you get up regulation of this so it's definitely a stress responsive protein but it's unlike anything else in the databases it has some conserved cysteines um but I would really like to find out what it's actually doing in the in the cells. We find out we have of the mutants of it and the mutants of slightly less chitin. So we at some point thought it might be involved in regulating chitin, but at the moment we don't know. <laughs> 
So unlike anything else in the database, so, so it's, mm -hmm. it's unique to Canada and there, there aren't other copies in Canada? So PG31 is part of a family, actually. So there's PG29, 30 and 31, okay. and they lie adjacent to each other on the chromosomes. So we think they've arisen from you know, a gene duplication event, but they are specific to the pathogen. So you don't find it in Saccharomyces cerevisiae, for example. Um, and I was kind of surprised that Candida auris has one, but it does have a homologue. Um, but the other two proteins in the family don't seem to be stress activated like PG31 is. So it's the only one that we see upregulated in response to the canicandins, for example. So I think over time, um, at least the regulation has changed. We have B5 tag versions of these different proteins that we can you know, localize to the cell wall. Um, we do need to understand a little bit more about the differences in that family. Um, Okay. Thanks, Carol. All right. Uh, I think I have a question here from Neil Gox uh, in response to your answer you gave me a moment ago, Jay, about the vesicle getting the DNA into the cell, as to whether the DNA is on the outside of the vesicle as opposed to the inside, and whether you've possibly tested DNAs as a treatment. Yes. So we did that experiment. So we have taken isolated vesicles, treated it with uh, with a, 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 a broad spectrum of DNAs. Um, and can still see preserved activity of those DNAs treated vesicles. So we believe that the cargo is inside the cell. Um, um, we've uh, and so, but if we before, uh, so that's so that that experiment is done. So we know that it's inside the cell. Um, the experiment that we would like to do, though, though we found it to be technically challenging, is to be able to actually um, uh, open up the vesicle, treat it with the DNAs, and then replace, and then allow that vesicle to come back and actually essentially use the DNAs activity within the, within the vesicle and show that those vesicles no longer are capable of doing that. And we've had some dif uh, technical di difficulties in terms of doing that, mostly because um, these vesicles don't stay open very well and they, they're fairly, uh, uh, very tight in that area. So we are continuing to try to overcome that technical obstacle so that we can actually formally show it. But if we leave them untreated or if we leave them kind of intact, treat the outside, um, that has no uh, effect of its ability, its activity. That is that activity, uh, that DNA, the DNA inside is still preserved and still is active in the system. Okay, and then related to that a little bit, um, there's a question again um, about mixed species biofilms and whether the EVs are organism specific or could pick up components from other organisms and biofilms, for example, or whether this could potentially be synergistic or not, whether you have had a look at that in any way? Yeah, so embedded in that question is in, in mixed species is to suggest that there's um, that uh, that there could be some, you know, either contribution of other different types of vesicles in, in, in let's say, a clinical sample where there might be a polymicrobial process. We've not looked at that part. What we have done is to systematically now start to look at, um, we've focused on the entire story that I shared with you is in Canada Albicans. And so what we've tried now to do is look at other organisms that are of clinical relevance um, because we know there's a host of other fungal organisms that are capable of making that. And under Hannah and Chris's leadership, they've largely started to look at a number of different organisms, including Cryptococcus, Saccharomyces, uh, Canada auris, a number of other species within Canada. And what we are seeing is there's actually a fairly heterogeneous types of responses. We are all able to see that they all make extracellular vesicles, but their ability to actually upregulate this um, is all preserved, but it does it at very different levels. And so we're trying to better understand what is the nature of that differential type of response? Um, some of the, in fact, histoplasma is one of the most, uh, uh, those EVs tend to be some of the most uh, potent in terms of turning this process on, but why that's the case and why is it less the case for some of these other organisms is an area of active investigation. Thanks, Jay. Back to you, Geraldine. Okay, Carol, I'm gonna read this one and hope I get it right. Um, is the effect of the antibodies in mice survival due to the activity inhibition of the protein targets or the FC part of the antibodies, or both? And then did you test whether the antibodies inhibit the UTR2 transglycosylase? Right. Um, so the, we think the protection to the mice are through the FC function of the antibodies because we don't see any growth inhibition when we treat cells with the antibodies in the, in the lab. Um, so we, don't, we haven't tested to see whether they actually block the activity of of the enzymes of UTR2. Um, again, that's something that we, we could look at doing, but we do think it's to do with the vector functions of the 
antibodies, for example, we, we've shown that, and now we've just got preliminary data, that the antibodies will enhance neutrophil killing um, when we opsonize with the antibodies before we challenge with uh, the candida albicans. So, yeah. Okay, thanks. Right, Jay. Um, here's a question uh, regarding the other pathway that drives top one interferon inside the cell. Um, it's the rig, rig IMDA5 arm. And presumably the extra vehicles vesicles also contain RNA. So the question is, is this arm activated similarly and functions similarly in your model? Um, uh, great question. Um, has yet to be explored by us. Um, and um, and so we do think that, that we, we suspect that that is the case. Um, it may also have some uh, either additive or synergistic effects. Um, it's simply not a question that we've um, answered just yet. But I, I do believe that this is probably a general activation pathway. And if you think about in terms of a model, you know, I guess I would just say that, you know, um, I've always assumed that when innate immune cells were coming into contact with uh, fungal organisms, that the first point of physical contact was the time that this was actually happening. I think these vesicles actually represent an opportunity for the cells to be primed in such a way so that they will have a significant, they'll be ready for the physical interaction. It's kind of the, you know, and, and I think that that's probably going to be related to an immune response that's going to be directed towards, uh, that is going to be directed by the DNA. I suspect there's probably going to be another signaling circuit that's going to be through the RNA. And I also suspect that there's going to be some proteins within that vesicles that will also help um, um, uh, uh, gear the, the innate immune response to have an optimal response or a protective response to these fungal organisms. Thank you, Jay. Geraldine. Okay, Carol, in your animal model, did you evaluate the cells involved in the antibody protection? No, we haven't done that yet. We haven't done anything as sophisticated as that. We've just looked at survival and uh, burdens. Um, yes, yeah, certainly we could do that. I think we really are keen to understand the mechanism of action of the antibodies and how they are protecting the mice. So, um, yeah, I think that's something we should look at. Okay, thanks. Okay, so uh, there's questions coming that I'd missed be beginning, otherwise I would have put them in. I think they've just come in. So one of the questions that's just come in is, why do you think Candida Alba can secrete extracellular vesicles in the first place? What would be the, its evolutionary advantage, Jay? Yeah, so I, um, I'm i not a mycologist or a, a fungal biologist. I'll, I'll let me, so, so I'm going to get out here a little bit beyond the tips of my skis. So I'm going to look to see if there's others in the audience, either through the chat or elsewhere, to, who might be able to correct me. But my understanding is these these vesicles are are really meant for Canada Canada interactions. They're they're a way, a way to um, sense the environment and to share that information with others. And so, um, in a normal way, these are these are really meant to be able to provide that type of information. And I think, as such, is probably a very um, a, a important part of this. Um, and so Dave Andes has shown that if you use a specific molecule, this is a paper that he published in the Journal of Clinical Investigation, where if you use some, uh, a, a small molecule that blocks the ability of the, the candidate to make these extracellular vesicles, it has a significant um, uh, effect on the, the ability for these organisms to be virulent um, in that setting. And so that's a, that's a very, very novel pathway and a very important, I think, uh, mechanistic understanding um, in that area. So I think the immune system is largely kind of, you know, and I, you know, I'm a person who is, let's say, a little bit biased to those kind of uh, spy thrillers. I think it's just about a listening into that communication that's occurring between Canada, under, intercepting that message, using that as a way to use as an early detection system, and then pri and then priming the innate immune response to be ready for that type of uh, fungal in infection. And when that advanced information is provided, then the cells are are, are poised to be able to, to kill the, that type of organism. So that would be the model that I would say. I, there's gaps in terms of our evidence to support that model, but it is the model that I think is emerging that we we would like to use additional data to evaluate. Thanks, Jay. Geraldine. Hey, Carol. Um, do you know whether the Caspa fungin regulated proteins, candida proteins, are naturally targeted by human antibodies? So do you see serum antibody reactivity against PGA31 and UTR2? So for, for UTR2, definitely. So the this so it, it's also a member of a family, the CRH family, and they've shown for both um invasive aspergillosis and invasive candidiasis that there are antibodies against the CRH family um, in patients with those diseases. PG31, I don't know, um, but for CRH family, yes, for sure. Okay. 
that was work done by Javi Arroyo and uh, Jean-Paul Lachey, I think. Thanks. All right, Jay, we've got, I've got one last question. There's actually two questions, but I'm going to combine it into a last question uh, to you from the audience. Um, so basically, it's around the phenotype that you're seeing. So what is it that's um, resulting in, in mortality in animals? Is it the fact that the CJS pathways prevent a septic response that's preventing mortality? How do, how do you think the inability of the sting animals to clear the infections is occurring? And how do you think? Yeah, two parts. It's a yeah, it's, and I I will probably provide a partial answer because I think we're still needing to uh, to to better understand some of the the aspects of this. I think that in a wild type mouse that has the capacity to have the sea gas and sting process uh, pathway there, that gets appropriately activated by the vesicles that are there. It leads to a fairly robust inflammatory response. We know that many of these organisms are found in the kidney, although not exclusively in the kidney. Um, you know, and then I think Scott Filler's data and others who have contributed in this literature have said that the, usually the cause of death for these particular types of mouse in this mouse model of IV canademia is largely through kind of a septic physiology. And so we think that this is likely contributing to that part. Um, what, we, what we think is when this pathway is disabled, um, we think that there is a, a moderate amount of inflammation that takes place but it isn't enough to sufficiently um, uh, cause septic physiology. And at the same time, it's also, uh, and therefore the mice have a survival advantage, but because of that, it breast, because the, the immune response is now not um, at its modest compared to this robust inflammatory response, that means organisms are allowed to persist in the in the, in previously sterile areas, and as a result of that, we continue to see fungal fungal um, uh, persistence in the long term survivors of these mice. And so it it leads to I think a fairly kind of um, challenging situation. We can have good enough amount of immune response to kill all the organisms, but we kill the host, or we mute the immune response at that point and allow for viability of the host but at the cost of fungal persistence in previously sterile tissues. And there may be a sweet spot in the middle there that we haven't identified because we've fully disabled that pathway. So we're still working on trying to figure out if you can do this in, 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 in a way that would, that might be dialable or tunable. Could you end up having survival and eliminating the fungal organism? We think that that may be possible, but we don't have experimental data to support that. And is, do you think there's a link possibly to metabolic rewiring of the immune cell? Have you looked at that at all? Yeah, um, it's, I think it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, you know, I think Bernie Huba has done some uh, really interesting data in terms of looking at this and, and connecting this with the mitochondria in terms of DNA. It has a wonderful story um, there that I think it, that really does point to the fact that there is going to be um, uh, opportunities for rewiring. And that rewiring, I think, will have both downstream effects in terms of kind of the resulting innate immune response, as well as kind of the, the shape of the adaptive immune response. So while I don't, while we, our lab does not have any data in that area, I do think that there's enough data um, from, uh, from our colleagues to suggest that there is metabolic rewiring that's going to be important that will, that will have a, a downstream effect on the, on the, the, both the innate, the later part of the innate and the, uh, the adaptive immune response. Thank you, Jay. Back to you, okay. Geraldine. Yes, uh, I think this is the last question for Carol. How stable are the antibody fragments in vivo? Do you need to do any modification to make them more stable for therapeutics? Yes, yeah, so we haven't tested that directly with ours and they are the full um, you know, IgG molecules. But what's known is that these antibodies are usually have um, you know, a half-life of one month. So we we really one of the I think the unique selling points of them is you could only you can treat your patient once a month with these antibodies and they'll 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 in circulation and a lot is known about the antibodies that are used in treatment of oncology etc so we know that these are are you know pretty stable stable molecules in vivo yeah but we'll need to do all that testing before we get to that stage with with ours okay okay well i think that brings us to the end of the micro talks we've we've been through all the questions it was great thank you carol and jay for your wonderful talks today very interesting and exciting and thank you, Geraldine, for co-chairing with me. And thank you to all the attendees who stayed to th for this session. And just remember, we'll see you again next month for the next Micro Talks Part 2 of Season 4. Thank you, everyone, and goodbye. Thank you. Bye.